Just to give you a sense of how common these things are, um, this is a, a table taken from something called the Leiden thrombophilia study, Leiden uh, referring to the city in Europe where the factor V mutation was described. Um, if you just take people off the street and check for these things, so if you look for factor V Leiden in, in unselected healthy subjects, people walking down the sidewalk, um, about 5% of Caucasians have factor V Leiden. So this is really, really common in terms of genetic mutations. The prothrombin gene mutation, somewhere on the order of 2 to 3%, again, most prevalent in Caucasians. If you look at the classic genetic clotting tendencies, protein C, S, and antithrombin deficiency, they're way, way less common. So these are very uncommon. Stronger risk factors, yeah, but they're not that common, just in the unselected population. If you look in patients that walk into a clinic with a clot and you start testing for these things, you'll start to find them more commonly. And certainly, if you look in certain types of patients, the far column over here uh, on your right, if you look in patients who are really young or have had more than one clotting event or a family history of clotting events, and you start to test for genetic clotting tendencies, you're going to find them a lot more commonly. But, but regardless of which population you look at, these two things are far and away the most common things. Okay? It doesn't mean, though, that everybody who's got factor V Leiden or prothrombin gene mutation is going to get a clot. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The vast majority of people with these mutations won't ever clot. Right now, our problem is we can't pick them out ahead of time. All we can identify is people have genetic tendencies, either based on blood tests or based on family history. We know about the acquired triggers, and we know when those situations find themselves in proximity to each other that we have a greater chance of getting a clot, and we should try to step in and do something about it. Um, so what are some of these acquired triggers? We've been talking about them. Let's go through them briefly. I like to break them down into sort of medical conditions and then other stuff. And other stuff is usually something we do to you, um, usually for good reason. But um, so here's a whole list of medical conditions. We're not going to go through them in detail, but suffice it to say there are a lot of diseases and medical conditions that increase your risk of clotting. And we've known about some of these for many years. Some of them are more newly recognized. Um, but this is stuff that happens to people along the, along the road of life. And if you get one of these things and you have the right genetic predisposition, there's a better chance you're going to get a clot. So we need to recognize those. The acquired triggers, these are the things that we can do something about, or at least we can see them coming. So immobilization, we've kind of alluded to this already, surgery, trauma, um, you know, a lot of mechanisms going on here. When people have surgery, they have injury, and when you have injury, your clotting system gets activated. Um, when people have surgery, they tend to not feel so good afterwards. We lay them in a hospital bed until they recover. We lay them on a couch at home until they recover. So you've got immobilization coming in. Um, pregnancy, estrogens, whether oral contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapy, oral estrogens, very well known as risk factors for clotting. Um, and then older age, I've already touched on. So a lot of triggers that we can say are sort of transient or we can see them coming, we can do something. Some of these things we don't see coming, but when they show up, we need to do something about it. So lots of acquired triggers, probably many more we don't know about, but this is a list that we've got to work with at the, at the present time. So just to, one more time, I promise I'll shut up about this. This genes plus triggers equals clot. This is really important. I mean, when I, when I talk to the medical students and the residents and fellows about this, if there's anything they get, this is what I want them to get. And, and so we have good data for factor V Leiden because it's really common. And again, this is data from that Leiden thrombophilia study. And, and the numbers are like this. So if you've got factor V Leiden, if you're a heterozygote, it means you've got one copy of the factor V Leiden gene and one normal factor V gene. You've got about a five to seven fold increased risk of having a venous thrombosis compared to somebody who doesn't have factor V Leiden. Now, five to seven fold increased risk sounds like a big number, but the baseline number is really pretty small. So five to seven times a small number is still a pretty small number. So in and of itself, factor V Leiden is not a horribly strong risk factor for clotting. If you just look at oral contraceptive use, and we've known about this since these things first came out in the 60s, there's definitely an increased risk of, of venous blood clots with the use of oral estrogens. And if you compare yourself to someone who doesn't take these, the risk is about three to four-fold. So three to four-fold increased risk, three to four times a fairly small number, still a fairly small number. So in and of themselves, birth control pills are not a horribly strong risk for blood clotting. But if you mix these together, so if you go back to our model here of genes plus triggers equals clot, if you take somebody with factor V Leiden and you plop them on an oral contraceptive pill and you compare them to someone who doesn't have those two things going on, now you're talking about a 35-fold increased risk of clotting. And I would argue that even 35 times two small numbers becomes a big enough number that it gets your attention. So this model is really important. It's, it's helped really shape our understanding of how all this works. We've got good numbers for these things because they're common. I think the same thing works for all the genetic clotting tendencies that we know about and probably many that we don't know about. So this is an important thing for us to understand in terms of trying to figure out how we can come in and prevent these things. 
This sort of graphically illustrates the same point in a different way. And I don't know if there's any clearer or not. It's just a fancy picture maybe. But um, I want to walk through it and, and hopefully you know, really, really nail this point home. So this is just a graph, a schematic, that plots age against your risk of clotting. So, and I won't define young and old uh, for fear of offending anybody. Um, suffice it to say I'm right in the middle. Um, so the risk of thrombosis goes up as you get older. We've known about that for many years. So if this is your baseline risk as you get older, the risk of clotting goes up, up, up. And hopefully you never reach this thrombosis threshold. Hopefully you, you die of old age or, or you get hit by a bus or something before you have a clot so you don't have to suffer this. But the point is there are things that can shove that baseline risk higher. So if you've got certain genetic factors or certain acquired triggers, your, the, the whole baseline risk comes up. And now all of a sudden you might cross that threshold before you're done. And then you see a clot happening. Another way of looking at this is to look at transient risk factors. So in this illustration, you have something like pregnancy. So here's a, here's a woman's baseline risk of clotting. You know, here's a period of time where the risk is increased because she's pregnant. And you get through this pregnancy, everything's fine. But then the next time you're pregnant, you're a bit older. And age is a risk factor. And so in this pregnancy, maybe she gets close enough to actually hit that threshold and have a clot. And this is how we think a, a lot of the explanations of, you know, why did it happen now? Why didn't it happen 10 years ago? I took the birth control pill for 10 years when I was younger. Now I take it and I get a clot out of the deal. It doesn't make any sense. Well, if you think about risk as a continuously evolving thing as you get older, we start to understand how these things can happen. And so, again, this is an understanding that's really come from recognizing how common some of these genetic things are. And, and I think it's really helped advance our understanding of how we can prevent these. All right. 